Chapter 7 of Book 8 of Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Kuyper. Les Miserables, Volume 4 by Victor Hugo, translated by Elizabeth Florence Hapgood. Book 8 Enchantments and Desolations. Chapter 7 The Old Heart and the Young Heart in the presence of each other. At that epoch, Father Gillenormand was well past his ninety-first birthday. He still lived with Mademoiselle Gillenormand in the Rue des Filles de Calvaire, numero six, in the old house which he owned. He was, as the reader will remember, one of those antique old men who await death perfectly erect, whom age bears down without bending, and whom even sorrow cannot curve. Still, his daughter had been saying for some time, "'My father is sinking.' He no longer boxed the maid's ears. He no longer thumped the landing-place so vigorously with his cane when Basque was slow in opening the door. The revolution of July had exasperated him for the space of barely six months. He had viewed almost tranquilly that coupling of words in the moniteur, Monsieur Humboldt, Comte, peer of France. The fact is that the old man was deeply dejected. He did not bend. He did not yield. This was no more a characteristic of his physical than of his moral nature. But he felt himself giving way internally. For four years he had been waiting for Marius, with his foot firmly planted, that is the exact word, in the conviction that that good-for-nothing young scamp would ring at his door some day or other. Now he had reached the point where, at certain gloomy hours, he said to himself that if Marius made him wait much longer, it was not death that was insupportable to him. It was the idea that perhaps he should never see Marius again. The idea of never seeing Marius again had never entered his brain until that day. Now the thought began to recur to him, and it chilled him. Absence, as is always the case in genuine and natural sentiments, had only served to augment the grandfather's love for the ungrateful child, who had gone off like a flash. It is during December nights, when the cold stands at ten degrees, that one thinks oftenest of the sun. M. Gillenormand was, or thought himself above all things, incapable of taking a single step, he, the grandfather, towards his grandson. "'I would die, rather,' he said to himself. He did not consider himself as the least to blame, but he thought of Marius only with profound tenderness and the mute despair of an elderly, kindly old man who is about to vanish in the dark. He began to lose his teeth, which added to his sadness. M. Gillenormand, without, however, acknowledging it to himself, for it would have rendered him furious and ashamed, had never loved a mistress as he loved Marius. He had had placed in his chamber, opposite the head of his bed, so that it should be the first thing on which his eyes fell on waking, an old portrait of his other daughter, who was dead, Madame Pomercy, a portrait which had been taken when she was eighteen. He gazed incessantly at that portrait. One day he happened to say, as he gazed upon it, "'I think the likeness is strong.' "'To my sister?' inquired Mademoiselle Gillenormand. "'Yes, certainly,' the old man added. "'And to him also.' Once, as he sat with his knees pressed together and his eyes almost closed in a despondent attitude, his daughter ventured to say to him, "'Father, are you as angry with him as ever?' She paused, not daring to proceed further. "'With whom?' he demanded. "'With that poor Marius.' He raised his aged head, laid his withered and emaciated fist on the table, and exclaimed in his most irritated and vibrant tone, 
poor Marius, do you say? That gentleman is a knave, a wretched scoundrel, a vain little ingrate, a heartless, soulless, haughty, and wicked man. And he turned away so that his daughter might not see the tear that stood in his eye. Three days later he broke a silence which had lasted four hours to say to his daughter point-blank, I had the honor to ask Mademoiselle Gilnormand never to mention him to me. Aunt Gilnormand renounced every effort and pronounced this acute diagnosis. My father never cared very much for my sister after her folly. It is clear that he detests Marius. After her folly meant after she had married the colonel. However, as the reader has been able to conjecture, Mademoiselle Gilnormand had failed in her attempt to substitute her favorite, the officer of Lancers, for Marius. The substitute, Theodore, had not been a success. Monsieur Gilnormand had not accepted the quid pro quo. A vacancy in the heart does not accommodate itself to a stopgap. Theodore, on his side, though he scented the inheritance, was disgusted at the task of pleasing. The good man bored the lancer, and the lancer shocked the good man. Lieutenant Theodore was gay, no doubt, but a chatterbox, frivolous but vulgar, a high liver, but a frequenter of bad company. He had mistresses, it is true, and he had a great deal to say about them, it is true also, but he talked badly. All his good qualities had a defect. Monsieur Gilnormand was worn out with hearing him tell about the love affairs that he had in the vicinity of the barracks in the Rue de Babylone. And then Lieutenant Gilnormand sometimes came in his uniform with the tricolored cockade. This rendered him downright intolerable. Finally, Father Gilnormand had said to his daughter, I've had enough of that Theodol. I haven't much taste for warriors in time of peace. Receive him if you choose. I don't know, but I prefer slashers to fellows that drag their swords. The clash of blades in battle is less dismal, after all, than the clank of the scabbard on the pavement. And then throwing out your chest like a bully and lacing yourself like a girl with stays under your cuirass is doubly ridiculous. When one is a veritable man, one holds equally aloof from swagger and from affected airs. He is neither a blusterer nor a finicky-hearted man. Keep your Theodore for yourself. It was in vain that his daughter said to him, But he is your grandnephew, nevertheless. It turned out that Monsieur Gilnormand, who was a grandfather to the very fingertips, was not in the least a grand uncle. In fact, as he had good sense, and as he had compared the two, Theodore had only served to make him regret Marius all the more. One evening, it was the 24th of June, which did not prevent Father Gilnormand having a rousing fire on the hearth, he had dismissed his daughter, who was sewing in a neighboring apartment. He was alone in his chamber amidst its pastoral scenes, with his feet propped on the andirons, half enveloped in his huge screen of Comorandel lacquer, with its nine leaves, with his elbow resting on a table where burned two candles under a green shade, engulfed in his tapestry armchair, and in his hand a book which he was not reading. He was dressed, according to his wont, like an incroyable and resembled an antique portrait by Garat. This would have made people run after him in the street had not his daughter covered him up whenever he went out in a vast bishop's wadded cloak, which concealed his attire. At home he never wore a dressing gown, except when he rose and retired. "'It gives one a look of age,' said he. Father Gilnormand was thinking of Marius lovingly and bitterly, and, as usual, bitterness predominated. His tenderness, once soured, always ended by boiling and turning to indignation. 
he had reached the point where a man tries to make up his mind and to accept that which rends his heart. He was explaining to himself that there was no longer any reason why Marius should return, that if he intended to return, he should have done it long ago, that he must renounce the idea. He was trying to accustom himself to the thought that all was over, that he should die without having beheld that gentleman again. But his whole nature revolted. His aged paternity would not consent to this. Well, said he, this was his doleful refrain, he will not return. His bald head had fallen upon his breast, and he fixed a melancholy and irritated gaze upon the ashes on his hearth. In the very midst of his reverie, his old servant Basque entered and inquired, "'Can monsieur receive monsieur Marius?' The old man sat up, erect, pallid, and like a corpse which rises under the influence of a galvanic shock. All his blood had retreated to his heart. He stammered, "'Monsieur Marius, what?' "'I don't know.' replied Basque, intimidated and put out of countenance by his master's air. I have not seen him. Nicolette came in and said to me, There's a young man here. Say that it is Monsieur Marius. Father Gillenormand stammered in a low voice, Show him in. And he remained in the same attitude with shaking head and his eyes fixed on the door. It opened once more, a young man entered. It was Marius. Marius halted at the door as though waiting to be bidden to enter. His almost squalid attire was not perceptible in the obscurity caused by the shade. Nothing could be seen but his calm, grave, and strangely sad face. It was several minutes before Father Gillenormand, dulled with amazement and joy, could see anything except a brightness, as when one is in the presence of an apparition. He was on the point of swooning. He saw Marius through a dazzling light. It was certainly he. It certainly was Marius. At last, after the lapse of four years, he grasped him entire, so to speak, in a single glance. He found him noble, handsome, distinguished, well-grown, a complete man, with a suitable mien and a charming air. He felt a desire to open his arms, to call him, to fling himself forward. His heart melted with rapture. Affectionate words swelled and overflowed his breast. At length all his tenderness came to the light and reached his lips, and by a contrast which constituted the very foundation of his nature, what came forth was harshness. He said abruptly, "'What have you come here for?' Marius replied with embarrassment, "'Monsieur,' Monsieur Gillenormand would have liked to have Marius throw himself into his arms. He was displeased with Marius and with himself. He was conscious that he was brusque and that Marius was cold. It caused the good man unendurable and irritating anxiety to feel so tender and forlorn within and only to be able to be hard outside. Bitterness returned. He interrupted Marius in a peevish tone. Then why did you come? That then signified, if you do not come to embrace me. Marius looked at his grandfather, whose pallor gave him a face of marble. Monsieur, have you come to beg my pardon? Do you acknowledge your faults? He thought he was putting Marius on the right road, and that the child would yield. Marius shivered. It was the denial of his father that was required of him. He dropped his eyes and replied, "'No, sir.' "'Then,' exclaimed the old man impetuously, with a grief that was poignant and full of wrath, "'what do you want of me?' Marius clasped his hands, advanced a step, and said in a feeble and trembling voice, "'Sir, have pity on me.' These words touched M. Gillenormand. Uttered a little sooner, they would have rendered him tender, but they came too late." 
The grandfather rose. He supported himself with both hands on his cane. His lips were white, his brow wavered, but his lofty form towered above Marius as he bowed. "'Pity on you, sir. It is youth demanding pity of the old man of ninety-one. You are entering into life. I am leaving it. You go to the play, to balls, to the café, to the billiard-hall. You have wit. You please the women. You are a handsome fellow. As for me, I spit on my brands in the heart of summer. You are rich with the only riches that are really such.' I possess all the poverty of age, infirmity, isolation. You have your thirty-two teeth, a good digestion, bright eyes, strength, appetite, health, gaiety, a forest of black hair. I have no longer even white hair. I have lost my teeth. I am losing my legs. I am losing my memory. There are three names of streets that I confound incessantly, the Rue Charat, the Rue de Chaume, and the Rue Saint-Claude. That is what I have come to. You have before you the whole future full of sunshine, and I am beginning to lose my sight. So far am I advanced into the night. You are in love, that is a matter of course. I am beloved by no one in all the world. And you ask pity of me, Pablo. Moliere forgot that. If that is the way you jest in the courthouse, messieurs the lawyers, I sincerely compliment you. You are droll. And the octogenarian went on in a grave and angry voice. Come now, what do you want of me? Sir, said Marius, I know that my presence is displeasing to you, but I have come merely to ask one thing of you, and then I shall go away immediately. You are a fool, said the old man. Who said that you were to go away? This was the translation of the tender words which lay at the bottom of his heart. Ask my pardon. Throw yourself on my neck. Monsieur Gillenormand felt that Marius would leave him in a few moments, that his harsh reception had repelled the lad, that his hardness was driving him away. He said all this to himself, and it augmented his grief, and as his grief was straightway converted into wrath, it increased his harshness. He would have liked to have had Marius understand, and Marius did not understand, which made the good man furious. He began again. What? You deserted me, your grandfather? You left my house to go no one knows whither. You drove your aunt to despair. You went off. It is easily guessed to lead a bachelor life. It's more convenient to play the dandy, to come in at all hours, to amuse yourself. You have given me no signs of life. You have contracted debts without even telling me to pay them. You have become a smasher of windows and a blusterer, and at the end of four years you come to me, and that is all you have to say to me. This violent fashion of driving a grandson to tenderness was productive only of silence on the part of Marius. M. Gillenormand folded his arms, a gesture which with him was peculiarly imperious, and apostrophized Marius bitterly. Let us make an end of this. You have come to ask something of me, you say? Well, what? What is it? Speak. Sir said Marius, with a look of a man who feels that he is falling over a precipice. I have come to ask your permission to marry. Monsieur Gillenormand rang the bell. Basque opened the door halfway. Call my daughter. A second later, the door was opened once more. Mademoiselle Gillenormand did not enter, but showed herself. Marius was standing mute with pendant arms and a face of a criminal. Monsieur Gillenormand was pacing back and forth in the room. He turned to his daughter and said to her, Nothing. It is Monsieur Marius. Say good day to him. Monsieur wishes to marry. That is all. Go away. The curt, hoarse sound of the old man's voice announced a strange degree of excitement. The aunt gazed at Marius with a frightened air, hardly appeared to recognize him, did not allow a gesture or a syllable to escape her, and disappeared at her father's breath, more swiftly than a straw before the hurricane. In the meantime, 
Father Gilnormand had returned and placed his back against the chimney-piece once more. "'You marry at one and twenty. You have arranged that. You have only a permission to ask, a formality. Sit down, sir. Well, you have had a revolution since I had the honor to see you last. The Jacobins got the upper hand. You must have been delighted. Are you not a Republican since you are a baron? You can make that agree. The Republic makes a good sauce for the barony. Are you one of those decorated by July? Have you taken the Louvre at all, sir? Quite near here, in the Rue Saint-Antoine, opposite the Rue des Normandières, there is a cannonball encrusted in the wall of the third story of a house with this inscription, July 28th, 1830. Go, take a look at that. It produces a good effect. Ah, those friends of yours do pretty things. By the way, aren't they erecting a fountain in the place of the monument of Monsieur le Duc de Berry? So, you want to marry? Whom? Can one inquire without indiscretion? He paused, and before Marius had time to answer, he added violently, Come now! You have a profession, a fortune made. How much do you earn at your trade of lawyer? Nothing, said Marius, with a sort of firmness and resolution that was almost fierce. Nothing? Then all you have to live upon is the twelve hundred livres that I allow you? Marius did not reply. Monsieur Gilnormand continued. Then I understand the girl is rich. As rich as I am. What? No dowry? No. Expectations? I think not. Utterly naked. What's the father? I don't know. And what's her name? Mademoiselle Fauchelevante. Fauch what? Fauchelevante. Pfft! ejaculated the old gentleman. Sir! exclaimed Marius. M. Gillenormand interrupted him with the tone of a man who is speaking to himself. That's right. One and twenty years. No profession. Twelve hundred livres a year. Madame la Baronne de Pontmercy will go and purchase a, a couple of sous worth of parsley from the fruitière. Sir, repeated Marius in the despair of the last hope, which was vanishing, I entreat you. I conjure you in the name of heaven with clasped hands, sir. I throw myself at your feet. Permit me to marry her. The old man burst into a shout of strident and mournful laughter, coughing and laughing at the same time. <laughs> you, oh, you said to yourself, Pardine, I'll go hunt up that old blockhead, that absurd numbskull. What a shame that I'm not twenty-five. How I'd treat him to a nice, respectful summons. How nicely I'd get along without him. It's nothing to me, I'd say to him. You're only too happy to see me, you old idiot. I want to marry. I desire to wed Mademoiselle no matter whom, daughter of Monsieur no matter what. I have no shoes. She has no chemise. That just suits. I want to throw my career, my future, my youth, my life to the dogs. I wish to take a plunge into wretchedness with a woman around my neck. That's an idea, and you must consent to it. And the old fossil will consent. Go, my lad, do as you like. Attach your paving stone. Marry your Pousselivon, your Coupelivon. Never, sir, never. Father. Never. At the tone in which that never was uttered, Marius lost all hope. He traversed the chamber with slow steps, with bowed head, tottering and more like a dying man than like one merely taking his departure. M. Gilnormand followed him with his eyes, and at the moment when the door opened and Marius was on the point of going out, he advanced four paces with the senile vivacity of impetuous and spoiled old gentleman, seized Marius by the collar, brought him back energetically into the room, 
flung him into an armchair and said to him, Tell me all about it. It was that single word, Father, which had effected this revolution. Marius stared at him in bewilderment. Monsieur Gillenormand's mobile face was no longer expressive of anything but rough and ineffable good nature. The grandsire had given way before the grandfather. Come, see here, speak. Tell me about your love affairs. Jabber, tell me everything. Sapristi, how stupid young folks are. Father, repeated Marius. The old man's entire countenance lighted up with indescribable radiance. Yes, that's right. Call me father, and you'll see. There was now something so kind, so gentle, so open-hearted, and so paternal in this brusqueness, that Marius, in the sudden transition from discouragement to hope, was stunned and intoxicated by it, as it were. He was seated near the table. The light from the candles brought out the dilapidation of his costume, which Father Gilnorman regarded with amazement. "'Well, father,' said Marius, "'ah, by the way,' interrupted M. Gilnorman, "'you really have not a penny, then? You are dressed like a pickpocket.' He rummaged in a drawer, drew forth a purse, which he laid on the table. "'Here are a hundred louis. Buy yourself a hat.' father pursued marius my good father if you only knew i love her you cannot imagine it the first time i saw her was at the luxembourg she came there in the beginning i did not pay much heed to her and then i don't know how it came about i fell in love with her oh how unhappy that made me now at last i see her every day at her own home her father does not know it. Just fancy, they are going away. It is in the garden that we meet, in the evening. Her father means to take her to England. Then I said to myself, I'll go and see my grandfather and tell him all about the affair. I should go mad first. I should die. I should fall ill. I should throw myself into the water. I absolutely must marry her, since I should go mad otherwise." This is the whole truth, and I do not think that I have omitted anything. She lives in a garden with an iron fence in the Rue Plumette. It is in the neighborhood of the Invalide. Father Gilnorman had seated himself with a beaming countenance beside Marius. As he listened to him and drank in the sound of his voice, he enjoyed at the same time a protracted pinch of snuff. At the words, Rue Plumette, he interrupted his inhalation and allowed the remainder of his snuff to fall upon his knees. The Rue Plumette, the Rue Plumette, did you say? Let us see. Are there not barracks in that vicinity? But why, yes, that's it. Your cousin, Theodore, has spoken to me about it. The Lancer, the officer. A, a gay girl, my good friend, a gay girl. Pardieu, yes. The Rue Plumette. It is what used to be called the Rue Plumette. It all comes back to me now. I have heard of that little girl, of the iron railing in the Rue Plumet, in a garden. Uh, Pamela, your taste is not bad. She is said to be a very tidy creature. Between ourselves, I think that Simpleton of a Lancer has been courting her a bit. I don't know where he did it. However, that's not to the purpose. Besides, he is not to be believed. He brags, Marius. I think it quite proper that a young man like you should be in love. It's the right thing at your age. I like you better as a lover than a Jacobin. I like you better in love with a petticoat sapristi with twenty petticoats than with Monsieur de Robespierre. For my part, I will do myself the justice to say that in the line of sans culette, I have never loved any one but women. Pretty girls are pretty girls, the deuce. There's no objection to that. As for the little one, she receives you without her father's knowledge. Well, that's in the established order of things. I have had adventures of that same sort myself, more than one. <laughs> do you know what is done then? One does not take the matter ferociously. One does not precipitate himself into the tragic. One does not make one's mind to marriage and Monsieur Le Maire with his scarf. One simply behaves like a fellow of spirit. One shows good sense. Slip along, mortals. Don't marry. 
you come and look up your grandfather, who is a good-natured fellow at bottom, and who always has a few rolls of louis in an old drawer, you say to him, see here, grandfather, and the grandfather says, that's a simple matter. Youth must amuse itself, and old age must wear out. I have been young. You will be old. Come, my boy, you shall pass it on to your grandson. Here are two hundred pistoles. Amuse yourself. Do take it. Nothing better. That's the way the affair should be treated. You don't marry, but that does no harm. You understand me. Marius, petrified and incapable of uttering a syllable, made a sign with his head that he did not. The old man burst out laughing, winked his aged eye, gave him a slap on the knee, stared him full in the face with a mysterious and beaming air, and said to him, with the tenderest of shrugs of the shoulder, <laughs> ah, booby! <laughs> Make her your mistress! Marius turned pale. He had understood nothing of what his grandfather had just said, this twaddle about the Rue Plumet, Pamela, the barracks, the lancer, had passed before Marius like a dissolving view. Nothing of all that could bear any reference to Cosette, who was a lily. The good man was wandering in his mind, but this wandering terminated in words which Marius did understand, and which were a mortal insult to Cosette. Those words, make her your mistress, entered the heart of the strict young man like a sword. He rose, picked up his hat which lay on the floor, and walked to the door with a firm, assured step. There he turned round, bowed deeply to his grandfather, raised his head erect again, and said, Five years ago you insulted my father. Today you have insulted my wife. I ask nothing more of you, sir. Farewell. Father Gilnormand, utterly confounded, opened his mouth, extended his arms, tried to rise, and before he could utter a word, the door closed once more, and Marius had disappeared. The old man remained for several minutes motionless, and as though struck by lightning, without the power to speak or breathe, as though a clenched fist grasped his throat. At last he tore himself from his armchair, ran, so far as a man can run at ninety-one, to the door, opened it, and cried, Help! Help! His daughter made her appearance. Then the domestics. He began again with a pitiful rattle. Run after him! Bring him back! What have I done to him? He is mad! He is going away! Ah, oh, my God! Ah! Oh! My God, this time he will not come back. He went to the window which looked out on the street, threw it open with his aged and palsied hands, leaned out more than halfway while Basque and Nicolette held him behind and shouted, Marius, 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 Marius. But Marius could no longer hear him, for at that moment he was turning the corner of the Rue Saint-Louis. The octogenarian raised his hands to his temples two or three times with an expression of anguish, recoiled tottering, and fell back into the armchair, pulseless, voiceless, tearless, with quivering head and lips which moved with a stupid air, with nothing in his eyes and nothing any longer in his heart except a gloomy and profound something which resembled night. End of Book 8, Chapter 7